And it's my honor and uh, great pleasure to host this panel discussion today on the topic of leading the way with new green innovative financial solutions. The title, in my view, includes two important subjects, green innovations, which will lead us to the technological aspects of um, the solution we try to thrive, and financial structuring, uh, which will help us to bring about the financial means to drive the agenda on energy generation and supply. I have to say, if we all believe that climate change is a fact and the consequences of such changes are already uh, starting to become a reality today, then it is utmost important we talk today about this topic. And in the context of this flagship conference that since 20 years has pursued an important mission of bringing energy sector practitioners from around <coughs> the world together to discuss important matters around the energy sector value change and in the context of Africa, then this is the right subject today. I'm very honored to moderate uh, this panel today, which includes a number of uh, very high caliber professionals and well-recognized experts in their areas of expertise. And please allow me to introduce them to you. On my left-hand side, we have Dr. Emma Razolo Vuangani, mm -hmm. who is um, from Madagascar. And uh, she has a very impressive CV. She has not only gained a lot of experience in the upstream industry of the energy sector value chain, and why this is certainly an important topic. Um, we are trying to also touch upon her other activities and experience in the context of the energy sector in Madagascar. Um, she has also put a candidacy in for the pre presidential elections in 2013. Um, now, I'm very happy that it didn't turn out like you would have to, because you probably wouldn't be sitting here today with me at least. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a great honor to have you and welcome uh, Emma. Uh, on my right-hand side, we have Koshik Ray, uh, who is a partner at the uh, Boutique Africa-focused law firm Trinity International LLP, whose practice focuses on advising lenders, sponsors, and multilateral agencies on renewable energy transaction in emerging markets. For the past years, eight years, he has advised the lenders to the Lake Tokana wind farm. He has also been involved in the Uganda Get Fit project and program, and is currently also advising ATI and KFW on the structuring of the risk uh, liquidity facility um, to which we're going to talk a bit later today in the panel as well. Then on my uh, further left hand side we have uh, Deo Onyango who is a renewable energy leader from General Electric. Uh, it uh, I think doesn't need much words to introduce to General Electric to you. A leading equipment supplier, a very critical part in bringing technical solutions for the uh, renewable energy agenda. To the uh, uh, utmost left, we have Ahmed Nakush, who is uh, currently the Vice President of the Moroccan Energy Federation, uh, but who was formerly the founding head of Morocco's biggest private developer, Nariva. And before that, um, Ahmed was on the public sector side. He was uh, with the, the head of the state utility ONA of Morocco. Um, Ahmed also will uh, today uh, speak in French we don't have translation devices, uh, devices here in the room, but I will do my utmost best to summarize in English what uh, he will tell us today. And last but not least, we have uh, on uh, my ultimate right-hand side, Jeff Vincent, who is with uh, Africa Trade Insurance. Um, he is in the business of political risk insurance since 19, the 1990s, and uh, he has been working more recently on the regional liquidity support facility, um, that will provide liquidity guarantees to renewable energy projects of up to 50 megawatt in, I think, in the beginning in uh, the southern part of, of Africa. And he also helped the Africa Energy Guarantee Facility with uh, the European Investment Bank. Uh, I understand you have also been asked to hold a bit the flag of the EIB up here since our formerly announced panelists from EIB couldn't be here. So very warm welcome to you and I'm really much looking forward in a minute to discuss with you plenty of things around this agenda. We will also have uh, a question and answering session towards the later part of the session. So please, um, I invite you to already write down any burning questions and issues you have, and we will try to address them in the latter part. Uh, before I invite my panel to uh, further discuss, I would like to um, set a little bit the stage um, about this topic today. Um, on my own organization, I can say that last year alone, the World Bank Group crowded in about 8.6 billion US dollars in private financing for climate change purposes and projects. 
uh, and which is up about 27% uh, from 2016. The, implements, uh, the instruments that the World Bank Group deployed included loans and credits, notably through the World Bank IBRD and IDA and IFC, but also risk mitigation measures like the guarantees from the World Bank and MEGA insurance. Um, in the last year alone, I think 1.5 billion US dollars were mobilized in a project in Argentina, and we have several projects in the making and financially closed in Sub-Saharan Africa. Another important and interesting fact is that on June 13, um, my organization and the other multilateral development banks of this world um, published a, a new report on climate finance in 2017 by the major multilateral development banks. According to this report, which is also publicly available, um, the financing for climate finance action um, ran to a seven-year high and totaled to 35.2 billion US dollars, which is uh, up also 28% of the previous year. Of these 35 billion dollars, about 79% went into what we call climate mitigation projects. So climate mitigation projects are, for example, re renewable energy projects, but also transport, uh, more energy-friendly, um, climate-friendly transport means and other measures. The remaining balance of about uh, 7.4 billion US dollars went into what we call adaptation projects. So these are already projects where we no longer try to just mitigate climate change, but we're trying to prepare developing countries f to deal and how to deal with the effects of climate change. Now, the other interesting uh, figure is that these 35 billion US dollars in total helped mobilizing or crowd in, if we may say, another 51 billion dollars of financing from other sources beyond the MDB's balance sheet, which I think is an important figure to bear in mind as well. At the same time, 81% of this financing was mainly in forms of loans. So those of you familiar with multilateral development banks, often loans are more on concessional terms or not entirely commercial terms. The lesser part, only 5%, related to risk mitigation instruments like guarantees and insurance, which are critical to crowd and especially private sector investment and capital. With regard to regional share, also very interesting facts. Latin America has been leading, uh, the, uh, the, has been the leading recipient of uh, this climate financing with about 20% out of the 35 billion, followed by Sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, makes about 16%, and then closely followed by East Asia and the Pacific and South Asia, each one of them about 14% of capital received. Now, another interesting fact is that we look at the uh, monies that went to Africa for climate change mitigation measures. We note that about uh, 0.9 billion US dollars went into renewable energy projects, renewable energy generation. But a figure actually a little bit higher of close to a billion US dollars went into a lower carbon generation, mostly natural gas-fired power plants and the likes. And there are so far hardly any investments in the sub-Saharan African context for energy efficiency measures, which I do believe is an agenda also highly uh, important and relevant for climate change. And I think the other interesting fact we need to take into account is that to date, according to World Bank uh, data and statistics, the majority of Af African utilities are still not solvent. In fact, we only have about two or three utilities on the entire continent who today would claim that they have tariffs that are fully cost reflective. We should not forget that angle of financial solvability and sustainability in the sectors, and I'm very grateful that we have panelists here that will further give us their views about this. Lastly, uh, and that will bring me to my first question, this all sounds impressive, but it is needless to say this is definitely not enough. And I'm taking this also to my own organization, 35 billion US dollars is, is a great figure. But if we trust a recent figure from the World Economic Forum, which projects that the globe would need to mobilize 5.7 trillion US dollars around the world to in fact help us cope with all what we need to do to address climate change and adapt to the consequences of it, we need to do more. And that's the purpose of our panel. And uh, I would like to first uh, start with uh, uh, Koshik. Koshik, I mentioned utility sustainability of mm -hmm. sectors, but equally important, I think, is the 
overall framework that we find in the sectors. For any project can be built and started, investors and financiers and utilities have to be in an environment where they feel comfortable to take decisions on, and that brings us to legal regulatory framework. Maybe out of your experience and expertise, what in your view is critical to help us bringing more financing to greening Africa's energy sector uh, forward? Thanks, Robert. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Robert said, my name is Koshik Ray. I'm a partner at uh, the international law firm Trinity, Trinity International. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're a boutique law firm advising almost exclusively on uh, African energy projects. So we uh, fit right into the African Energy Forum. Um, we currently are advising on renewable transactions in about 35 jurisdictions across the continent, both uh, Anglophone, Francophone, and, and, and Lusophone. Um, to address your question immediately, it's absolutely key. It should go without saying that effectively the procurement method that is in place in the country is really the first thing to look at. Um, I've had the pleasure in advising the seven DFI lenders and two commercial banks on the Lake Takana wind transaction in, in Kenya, 310 megawatt transaction for the last eight years, which is now completed construction and, and hopefully in the coming months will be connected to the national grid. Um, that was a direct negotiation. There were, you may know the story already, a, a, a team of um, uh, Dutch Kenyans who'd gone up north, tried to pitch a tent, realized it was too windy to pitch a tent, and then thought, oh, this might be a good place for a, for a wind farm. Now, and then approached government, approached uh, the offtaker KPLC, and sort of the rest is history in a way. That's a nice story uh, and, a, and, a, and a lovely way to deliver a, a very large project and one of the largest uh, renewable projects, uh, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but that should be the exception rather than the norm. So the first thing we tend to do is look at what exists already in the country in terms of framework. So is there a PPP law? Certainly the World Bank Group sponsors a lot of the, the writing of uh, PPP laws, which is fantastic to create frameworks. It's not just enough to have a PPP law, as you know. You then need to have the institutional and regulatory support that supports that. So if there's a PPP unit, is that PPP unit authorized? Where does the decision-making sit? Um, does the PPP unit hold the, the power to decide uh, on a cross-sectoral basis, or do you then still need to discuss with the Ministry of Energy or Ministry of Renewable Energy to the extent there is one? If there's no PPP law, what does the rest of the uh, sector look like? Is there an energy act or an electricity act? What are the, um, is there a procurement law? Particularly in civil law countries, there will be a, a directorate of, of, of marché public, of, uh, of public markets, and there will be very clear set out frameworks for, for how you procure projects. How does that interact with the energy act? How does that interact with the PPP law? All of these things can be mighty complicated in, in country. And very often our job is to try and navigate that because often the answer is actually we don't know and these two pieces of legislation clash. Uh, how, do we, how do we bring it? Do you need a decree? Do you need a new act of parliament or, uh, um, regulation? Um, a nice way of bringing that all together is programs. Again, very often sponsored by institutions. So Get Fit, which was uh, a KFW, German development agency, uh, funded and sponsored program, which you may be familiar with in, in Uganda, has delivered over 170 megawatts of clean uh, renewable energy over the, over the last four or five years. Um, that is a standardized set of documentation that has approval from at the highest levels of government. There is an implementation agreement with government obligations, uh, a PPA, standard form PPA with the Oftec, a UETCL. Um, and a, no, a number of other accoutrements that, that go with it. But that sets a very clear framework, which is why there's been such a, an easy, easy, much easier delivery of, of, of projects when that framework is very clear. Of course, the Scaling Solar Program, the IFC Scaling Solar Program, is another example of putting in place procurement methods and programs um, that developers and bidders can come into and they know the rules of the game, and that's always very important. Other ways of doing it, tenders, auctions. Um, Egypt has had a very successful second round of, uh, of solar bidding. 
Um, and then there are countries like Kenya where actually, because they've had a very good track record in delivering IPPs, whilst there's not a, a fixed set program, the utility KPLC is, is very well versed in negotiating PPAs and, and the existing regulatory framework is very clear. Um, it very much varies from, from country to country, so you certainly can't assume even between neighboring countries, between Ch Chad and Mali, it's not the same, it's not the same system. So very important to get advice, I would say that, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, but it is really, really important to, to get that advice early to avoid mistakes being made down the line. Very good. Thank you very much, Korshik. Indeed, very interesting, and I, I think uh, uh, though uh, a pertinent point uh, really to emphasize um, competition can be extremely helpful and critical in getting also the right answers and solutions of procurement, uh, but also building the capacity with, with uh, on the government side, uh, PPP units, also the PPP laws, um, and then also consider a programmatic approach uh, when it comes to projects. I'm going to pick up on that later with, so with, uh, with some of the other panelists. Let me turn to my left and uh, um, Emma, you, uh, I said before you, you were coming originally from the upstream petroleum industry and I, I myself a bit of a veteran from, from financing that side. But we are now in a new age where I think we also have to look beyond just the upstream and we have to also find non-thermal energy generation solutions. And I'm particularly impressed that you told me, I don't want to talk about this, I want to talk about something else, which I'm doing in Madagascar right now, I'm getting involved, and you have prepared a short yeah. presentation, so can I ask you, okay. Emma, to uh, tell us a bit in the context of Madagascar what you're currently doing there. And I hope the technology doesn't abandon us. Ah, okay. First of all, uh, thank you for coming to our uh, session. Um, we, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I have two minutes, two to four minutes, but uh, to link up with uh, what here, uh, Mr. Robert, Robert. Uh, I introduced, why we spend uh, the World Bank and all the MDP, the multinational development bank, and spend more money on the uh, lower carbon emission and also the uh, renewable energy is an example, a clear example is Madagascar. Because um, Madagascar is uh, actually the most vulnerable country in the world about the climate change. Madagascar have unique ecosystem and most of the endemic plant and animal, 80% of them doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So the climate change is the number one enemy of this, uh, to uh, destroy this. So I have to go fast because, okay, so what do we, are going, uh, one example, we are doing so many projects, but one example that we do to mitigate this is, uh, for example, okay, right here, Madagascar. The desert is ocean, it's destroyed. Madagascar is an island. Most of the people live in the coastal, and their food, the fish, and all their uh, income are decreasing because of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ocean is destroyed, the uh, plankton and the food of the uh, uh, sea uh, animal are decreasing. So the solution to go rapidly is we have a technology, actually Rush George is the expert on this. We develop uh, some kind of uh, uh, fertilizer to clean up the ocean, to bring back the ocean to its original uh, state to uh, regrow the uh, micronutrition so the fish will come back and uh, uh, will be on that. And uh, based on our experience, only in six months, the amount of fish is multiplied by 10 times. And actually, it, the incremental income to the country is an order of billion dollars. But that's not the, the most important thing. Okay, this is, I show before our uh, treatment and after, this is after our treatment. The sea is rich and healthy. And now I'll show you the most important thing, which is linked to what uh, uh, Mr. Robert say, why we spend more money is this one right here, right? The earth can only capture 1,000 gigatons. The air can only capture 2,000 gigatons of carbon, but the ocean can capture 60,000 gigatons of carbon. 
So right here, you put the emission next year, the, the air, the, the earth, as you say, has no capacity to save us from yesterday emission and no less the future. The air is already overfilled with CO2, so there's no hope there. So the humanity CO2 is, uh, is job, uh, you know, job in the ocean. This, if you compare, the amount of gigaton is just a drop in the ocean. So restoring the ocean to health is our best hope. This is just an example why we spend with that Turkey, why you spend more money in the lower carbon and the climate exchange. And over here, I don't know if I have time to, uh, uh, to explain it, but briefly, the, uh, what I'm saying is that there is a um, carbon credit, millions, millions of income for the country on top of that due to the carbon credit. This is, uh, came out from the uh, uh, Paris Accord in 2000, December 2015. Besides also the income from the population, Madagascar is an island, people will get more, more, more revenue, the government will get more millions in carbon credit, the ocean is rich and clean, and we save the, uh, the world. Okay, the next, the last one, I only have three slides. This is the last slide, I'll go one minute in here. This is, uh, the title of our panel is uh, Innovative Way of uh, financing the, uh, uh, the actually the green energy. We are doing it in Madagascar. I was hesitating to bring this here because this is what we do. The affordability of electricity in Madagascar. Madagascar is a poor country, one of the poorest countries. People can afford uh, paying uh, the electricity. So we offer alternative way of paying. Uh, we sell electricity by credit. So when they have product, they can bring the cocoa, they can bring the vanilla, whatever. There are a lot of gold in southern Madagascar. I just put this right here. This is a, um, a off-grid rural electrification. We have 43 uh, projects in southern Madagascar. We paid by gold and cipher, emeralds, and it's very profitable, and the, uh, the investor likes it very much. And also, in here, this is something that also we do in uh, southern Madagascar. It's, it's over there, it's desert. There is no, uh, of course, the electricity is coming, the water is coming, but here we are trying to find the plateau of water in beneath the ground to actually irrigate the entire southern desert Madagascar. And now we provide this, and that is our solution to uh, alleviate poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emma. <laughs> very impressive indeed, and um, I think it's, um, it shows us also, and mindful that this is an energy conference, that climate change has very different faces and can be approached from different angles. And combining different solutions um, is, I think, the key to, to move forward. Yet to say also that, um, as you mentioned, this all needs financing. So here another area, I think, where, where we should focus on. So thank you very much. Let's maybe move uh, from the eastern part of the continent to the uh, western part. And uh, Ahmed, I would like to invite you to give us a bit your views. On one hand, what your and your experience as leading the uh, um, public utility ONA and also the energy sector in Morocco, uh, what has been your, your experience there and how you see what is critical for utilities today when we talk renewable energy and, and how to um, bring power to, to the people and also um, your, maybe your views uh, on the front of IPPs, because IPPs are often uh, the solution for public-private partnerships in the renewable energy field. Um, so please give us your thoughts, and uh, I will take notes carefully to summarize in English ah. what you're going to tell us in French. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Robert. Sorry, my English is uh, very bad, so <laughs> I prefer speaking French. Uh, le si vous voulez, aujourd'hui, au Maroc, nous avons, euh, vous le savez probablement, nous avons une stratégie qui prévoit un mix énergétique à l'horizon 2030 avec 52% de puissance installée en énergie renouvelable, solaire, euh, éolien et hydraulique. C'est-à-dire on, on prévoit 20 000 MW de puissance installée, dont plus de 10 000 MW en renouvelable. Et la plupart de ces projets sont réalisés dans le cadre de IPP. Vous, 
vous permettez de, oui, de traduire. So I think um, Ahmed first says that uh, Morocco has decided on uh, on an energy strategy which uh, clearly fosters for a healthy energy mix, and that I think still to be reached. Um, Uh, Morocco wants to achieve at least 52 percent of, renew yes. of renewable energy in its uh, in its country system, uh, mainly to be made up of um, solar and wind, uh, wind and, and wind and, and hydro and wind. And I think you said also uh, you're aiming for 20,000 megawatt of yeah, total 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 of capacity. renewable energy would be 2,000 yeah. megawatt by when? Uh, 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 2030. 2030. Alors, si nous avons aujourd'hui cet objectif, c'est parce que 20 ans plus tôt, on a réalisé un programme euh, avec l'aide de, la de la Banque mondiale à l'époque de généralisation de l'accès à l'électricité. Nous avons développé un réseau de transport et de, et de distribution qui couvre l'ensemble du territoire, avec une interconnexion avec l'Europe vers le nord et une interconnexion avec l'Algérie vers l'est. So 20 years ago, this whole uh, new strategy evolved from uh, another strategy Morocco took about 20 years ago, uh, which was a strategy for universal access to energy in the entire country. Uh, and that also included uh, strategic interconnections not only to neighboring countries in Algeria, Uh, but also an interconnection of electricity trade to uh, Europe. To Europe, absolutely. Et aujourd'hui, euh, 99,9% des citoyens sont connectés au réseau national. So 99. Voilà, 99. So today, the result of that strategy is that today in Morocco, you have 99% of energy access in the entire country, which I think is ah. very high up there in the African context. Voilà. Mm. Et c'est ce qui me fait croire que pour l'Afrique, le, le développement d'un alors, ces, ces, ces projets répondent à trois objectifs. L'accessibilité, l'abordabilité et la soutenabilité. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut que l'énergie soit accessible et de qualité, il faut qu'il soit à un prix abordable et il faut qu'on s'inscrive dans, dans le développement durable. So, um I think uh, Ahmed now also says that for Africa in a whole, if, if the Moroccan example is, is copied, um, What he wants, would like us to know is that the three objectives that he believes are very important to achieve any renewable energy solution is that first you have to have access in the country, sufficient access for energy, you have to have uh, to address the affordability issue, and you also have to have a sustainable solution. Voilà. Et, et, et nous, je suis convaincu que le modèle marocain est transposable à beaucoup de pays africains. Et je suis convaincu qu'on ne peut avoir un système électrique euh, fiable que si on développe une infrastructure de transport et de distribution. Et que la, la solution d'énergie décentralisée, c'est une solution de court et moyen terme, mais à mon avis, ne peut pas être une solution de très long terme. Ça, c'est mon point de vue. So, um Ahmed believes that definitely the, uh, the Moroccan experience should be uh, uh, able to be translated in many other African countries. Um, as long as some core principles of, uh, first of all, having uh, the right transmission system in place uh, and having a certain grid expansion. Uh, but I think also you mentioned that at the same vein, the off-grid solutions in the, in the shorter to medium term have to be, be building the bridge until you have created a national uh, electricity grid. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's the only way that allows to bring the financing towards the sector. Parce qu'au fait, quand vous avez une infrastructure euh, euh, viable, quand vous avez une bonne régulation, quand vous avez de bons projets, eh ben, on arrive à lever des financements sans aucun problème. Un autre aspect intéressant que Ahmed partage avec nous est que son is est que la importance critique de créer des conditions de terre bonnes, comme je l'ai dit plus tôt, Koshik a parlé d'un framework légal sur le plan technique, les pays doivent créer des Um, uh, create good grids, uh, a good overall environment. If these things are right, then Ahmed's belief is that um, attracting private capital and investment uh, will be much easier uh, if the framework parameters are right. Voilà. C'est bon. Merci beaucoup. Je, merci. Thank you very much. So um, that these are these are very also interesting and important points about the readiness of the uh, of the countries and um, and um, what they could do. 
on the technical side to get ready and, and entice more private investment. I would like to turn to you, Deo, as now our technical expert, if I may say, uh, coming from GE. What is it that from a GE perspective or um, the perspective of a major equipment supplier in terms of financial solutions or financing um, availability, how do you see things that technology may need or yourselves will s have seen where, where gaps are and bridges are we need to work harder on to bring in solutions? Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, from, a, from a technology perspective, uh, the couple of things, uh, the first and most important thing when you think about innovation, it's less about innovation, but it's more about uh, equipment suppliers participating more than just their core competence, which is the supplier of the technology. Uh, there's a couple of things that this involves. Uh, one, for example, is being able to provide project development funding mm -hmm. that helps to instigate the project uh, mm -hmm. and actually be very confident and give confidence in participating in the project development. And, and that helps to bring in best practice into the whole development cycle, mm -hmm. uh, which at the later stage will give confidence to uh, debt uh, providers as well, uh, as well as equity uh, investors. Mm -hmm. The second thing is um, when you think about creating a win-win for the where the equipment is manufactured, um, if it is not manufactured on the continent, the, the equipment providers have a very big responsibility to mobilize uh, export credit agency funding, right? And it creates a very big, big uh, clear big win for the manufacturing country, as well as where the equipment will be deployed, uh, wherever the project may be across the continent. The third area is in uh, being able to give a lot of confidence to equity investors. We have, in the case of GE, we have a number of large equity investors who are confident that wherever GE is participating in a project, they're confident that they will be able to accrue a good return. Uh, and as well, GE will work together with, uh, if it's the country uh, and, and all of the, the, the structure that's been put around the project, that GE will actually be able to accrue a good return for them. So it's giving confidence to equity investors to continue uh, investing in the, in the continent. So I think the first is thinking about, from our equipment uh, provider perspective, being able to participate more in the whole, uh, uh, you know, earlier with, with outside of our core computers. The second thing that we need to look at is also uh, the trends within the sector. Uh, there's a lot of debate between centralized or decentra decentralized energy uh, and the, the fact that uh, green energy is actually providing quite a big uh, leapfrog across the continent in uh, decentralized off-grid uh, energy. Now, with the trends comes, what are the financing solutions that would make it sustainable? I think there is a very big responsibility for uh, equipment manufacturers to actually look at the trend, to participate in it, and to give confidence for new investment uh, in that area that then supports the increased deployment, especially on the off-grid side. Um, and I think when we look at the continent, there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunity for centralized uh, and uh, you know uh, generation, but at, at the same time, off-grid generation or decentralized generation is really going to support more. Financing there is you know will follow a lot of equipment manufacturers that are willing to help structure solutions for that that uh, supports that trend. Uh, and I think the third area also that we have a responsibility from an equipment supplier perspective is also looking at where there are gaps. One of the biggest gaps acro across the continent th uh, in order to deploy more green energy is uh, with regards to transmission and distribution, right? Transmission and distribution really mm -hmm. you know, is a big <coughs> gap across the continent. And green energy, even being able to balance between you know, the discussion around base load uh, and uh, wind, solar, hydro, technology, transmission ends up being the gap. And, you know, historically, transmission is very much left to the utility and to the government, right? We do have a responsibility to work with governments to figure out how can we make transmission and distribution move faster, because that's going to help more generation, right? And as an equipment supplier, I think we have a very big responsibility to look at different ways that we can bring more financing into an area such as transmission and distribution. Very interesting and um, I'm very complimentary I find to what uh, Ahmed told us before. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you are saying that um, 
um, especially for renewable energy, grid solutions need the right transmission and distribution infrastructure and still the, the issue with the base load and especially <coughs> in the African context with uh, a lot of access rates still being very low mm. and still a lot of generation uh, uh, um, deficits. Um, the off-grid solution seems to be a, a low-hanging fruit in the short term Absolutely. for also renew renewable solutions. So um, a very, very interesting perspective indeed. Let me turn now to, uh, let me say, the, the towards rather the, uh, the end of the final project decision moment, the financial closure. Uh, Jeff, you are a veteran in the industry of risk mitigation, also uh, an agenda that I'm pursuing on a daily basis. And uh, um, ATI has a terrific rec record of being a strong partner in risk mitigation in the entire continent. How do you see um, basically risk mitigation solutions today? Are we where we should be with regard to the needs of the capital markets and investors uh, and also with regard to the agenda, which seems to be uh, kind of in a dual mode, off-grid and main-grid? Um, share, share your thoughts, please, with us and your experience. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, first, I would like to make a distinction between commercial risk and political risk. Commercial risk is really uh, is a risk that will always exist as soon as you have more than one party involved in transaction. People have to pay money to somebody else. There's always a risk that, that the money will not be paid. And that is something that they, uh, the risk mitigation instruments, they exist all over the world and they continue to be used all over the world. So that is fact of life. Political risk, uh, you don't have a lot of political risk insurance in, in Western Europe. And you have a lot of demand for political risk insurance in Africa. It means that we in Africa, we live in an imperfect world and uh, that makes that uh, there's either a perceived risk or a real risk that the government will not keep his promises, that the off-taker will not pay this, uh, the, the IPP, that the suppliers will not be paid in, in response, etc. And uh, then either the risk, the risk is really high and the project don't go through, or the project, the, the, the risk is minimal and then there will be no need for ins insurance or risk mitigation. And then there's an area in between where guarantees and insurance can work to attract investments and, uh, and, uh, and to move things forward. And that is what we are really doing. Guarantees, insurance are patchwork. Ideally, as you mentioned earlier, utilities should, be, should have costly reflective tariffs, they should be profitable and they should be so strong that there's no need for, uh, for demand for, for off-taker risk. Um, in practice, now you have uh, two worlds of risk mitigation instruments. One uh, is the insurance, and uh, I think they all mentioned the, the ECAs, so the the Afrexim, uh, the, the uh, US Exim Bank, the it's uh, it's Sinosure for uh, Nexi, Kshure, etc. On the other hand, you have multilaterals, so that's like us. It's like. Uh, uh, ICEC from the Islamic Development Bank, and then you have the developmental financial institutions that have discovered the power of guarantees to leverage the capital better, and that are now very productive in inventing new guarantee products. And the whole world becomes a bit less transparent and more difficult to understand because there are so many initiatives. And um, in that respect, I would say they are, uh, I think. First of all, what the work that the, the specialized legal firms are doing in helping governments to create more consistent legal regulatory framework will help enormously, because maybe then there's no really a, a need for guarantees and insurance anymore. But on the, other, on the other hand, there's also a need, I think, for creating platforms where all the providers of risk mitigations come together and where they really help to support each other, and so that for the developers, for the suppliers, also clear what is available in which country, for which resource, and for what size of, of project. Um, in that respect, so the, uh, the AEGF, Africa Energy Guarantee Facility, that we have developed together with EIB and Munich Re is, is interesting because it really tries to create a platform. Right now, w what is the system? ATI will ensure uh, SE for all eligible projects. We will be reinsured by Munich Re, and in the end, EIB is giving a stop-loss guarantee to Munich Re, so that Munich Re is able to take on more risk uh, that, that we are writing, and we can take, take on more projects and bigger projects. The interesting thing is that it's an open structure. 
So it means that we are inviting other insurers, we're inviting other reinsurers, we're in, uh, inviting other guarantors to participate in that. So we have now a, a, a good framework. And basically, if there's a need for more capacity, everybody will be invited to participate. And I think that is uh, an interesting development, and I really hope it will succeed. Thank you. Very good. So interesting uh, also, uh, Jeff, to, to, to see if your view that you see the different layers of risk mitigation, commercial, political, and the differentiation between insurance and guarantee programmatic approaches like yourself have currently seen in the clear urge that the industry has to still, industry and the MDBs and others have to still work more and bring more innovative solutions on, on that front, uh, particular tailor-made for the context in Africa and else, elsewhere. Now I'm looking at the clock and mindful of time. Uh, we're about uh, in the last 15 to maximum 20 minutes. Um, I have a number of follow-up questions, but if uh, the audience is ready now for uh, asking questions to the panel, I would much prefer to give the floor to you or and ask our panelists any burning questions or comments you have. So if we have a good uh, sense of questions, let's start with that. Yes, please, the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Sunil Benimandu. Uh, there is a project which actually turned rather bad in Kenya called Kenangop. And I think eventually it went into arbitration. Without going into the sort of rather emotional issues of who is to blame and which party did things wrong, what lessons can one learn from Ken and Cop from a promoter's point of view? Nice. Thank you. And would you have a suggestion who should respond to that, or do you can leave that to me? From a sort I can of probably take that. Yeah. Okay. But also, possibly, Jeff from a sort of insurance. Mm -hmm. point. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. Um, there's a proper legal answer, and then there's a softer commercial answer, and I think. Jeff can also talk about the, sort of the political aspects. Um, the specific legal issue, um, one of the specific legal issues, um, is, is land and land reform. And obviously land is, 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 is a key and a very hot topic across every country. And it's dealt with very differently in, in, in each country. So the nature of the land, whether you have a concept of public land, community land, tribal land, private land and, and, and the like. Kenya itself has obviously been through a number of reforms in the last six or seven years, new land acts, land reform acts, land registration acts, a new constitution. All of these have changed the landscape uh, somewhat. So there are particular legal circumstances. Um, the other kind of slightly softer thing, which I'll just touch on before I, I, I let um, Jeff commentate, um, it is always important if you're a developer, and it should go without saying, but it is absolutely key that you have buy-in from all of your stakeholders. And all of your stakeholders obviously includes high-level government, but it very much includes the people on the ground. So, And it's not always just enough to tick some boxes and do a resettlement action plan according to, to um, uh, performance standards actual genuine community relations on the ground are, are really important. And I know people have learned that lesson and, and, and taken it forward. And, and the good developers that we work with know that from the very beginning. And it should be innate. It shouldn't be, oh, there's a piece of land. Let's go and build on it. Everyone should have that awareness of, of, of the impact on, on, on community and communities. Um, so that's the slightly sort of softer stuff. But pe perhaps, Jeff, you can commentate on the political aspects. Well, uh, thank you very much. So ATI was involved in Kinogop. So we were ensuring the bank that was supposed to provide the liquidity guarantee. So we followed it very closely. Uh, well, th the big problem is, uh, from legal perspective, what is the value of a letter of support or letter of comfort that is given by the government? Yeah. And can developers rely on that? And sadly, because of Kinogop, so the Kenyan government has now weakened significantly its letters of support and basically make it made it more difficult for the IPPs to become bankable. So that is a, yeah. so that's, and, and, uh, and that's a, mm -hmm. I think a government has two, two options. One is, what I say, what, what is being done in Argentina, where you have a very strong state-owned company that in turn is, is, is guaranteed by MIGA that says, we take all the risk and now be as cheap as possible. And what's happening in Africa is that, on the other hand, it's rather the, the, 
the government say, well, there are so many potential developers, let's make them their life more difficult, uh, have, li have uh, local, law local law applied, local arbitration, soften or withdraw the, the lets of support, and as a result, th the power will remain reasonably expensive. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah absolutely. I have some sympathy with, with central government because we, we talk about political risk, and poli the general risk analysis should be that risk sits with who's ever best able to manage it. But politics is always local, so there are things that the Ministry of Energy or the Ministry of Finance can do and can promise that has very little to do with the politics on the ground in a village in, in, a, in a remote part of the country. And that's a, a reality, and that's a reality that, that everyone needs to be aware of. Right. Uh, I'd just like to add, uh, yes, we yes. also participate in the project. And I, for me, a big, uh, you know, the government's reaction with the letter of support is a consequence of the realization of the burden they carried with that letter of support. I don't think government is at fault to have made the change, but it comes down to the biggest lesson learned, in my opinion, is the community. You know, if I at the end of the day with um, renewable energy, wind, solar, you're going to use land. Who owns the land? If you're doing it in an area where there's a large community that's involved, they are probably the biggest stakeholder. Does the investor recognize that and therefore structure the project to include them? And I'll give the example, you know, again in Kenya, we're doing a wind project, uh, not too far from where the Kinago project is. It's in uh, an area called Kajiado. It's a Maasai community. Um, we started the development of that project uh, you know, very earlier on by getting the participation of the community, getting the elders to approve our willingness to develop a project within them. One of the key things we put forward to them, we say, we are going to put a, a beneficial structure that the community will have. End result is we created a community trust. Um, the community, every individual in the community directly related to the project or affected by the project, uh, is within the, is registered into this trust. The trust has a non-negotiable 5% uh, share of the revenues of the project, and the trust has a governance structure with very clear, you know, uh, uh, exec items that it has to address: schooling, health, and all of these additional things. So even if a new child is born into the community, he gets into the trust structure, and there's a beneficial clarity that they have. I can tell you, in the six, seven years of the development of that project. You know, even against political interference, the community has protected our the work that we've done. So you know, you cannot disregard the importance and the power of the community that can create a collapse of a project. A very, um, I see a very good question because I think it reminds us of the very complexity of any individual transaction, but also the important to never forget it has to be a win-win for everybody. There has to be a respect for the, all the project stakeholders of, of their rights. There has to be an outcome that is beneficial to um, all the stakeholders. Uh, and only that is probably a recipe for good projects. Um, let's take two, uh, two more questions. So gentlemen, here has a mic, and then uh, after that, I leave it to you. Thank, thank you very much. My name is Mr. Thaya Osmundsen from Empower New Energy. I would like to ask a question to um, to Jeff Vincent of ATI, who I think I think ATI has been very, prom uh, I would say, proactive the last uh, couple of years in, in uh, you know, developing together with partners various mechanisms. And I have a question relating to s commercial industrial renewables, because uh, very often the discussion is related to government-related type of risk. But of course, when you are developing renewables, with and especially solar, with commercial industrial customers. There's also a commercial risk. Um, the projects are smaller. There may be one, one to two, three megawatt. So the question is, to which extent do they make the, the facilities that you described, would they apply? Would it be attractive for uh, a commercial type customer, off taker? And the second is, if the off project is separately are too small, how would you view a kind of a portfolio Type of insurance uh, solution for this kind of project. What would that be? The when would that be the, the requirement? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Before you answer this, I suggest we take the, the other question still, and then um, we will we will address both and then sum it up. Thank you, Said Moulin from Morocco. I'm heading Moroccan Agency for Energy Efficiency. I was listening to what Eva said, but 
you manage in Morocco to attract green financing for big solar plants. The CTF financed almost 165 million euros for big solar plants. When we have another program for helping farmers to switch from diesel pumps to solar pumps, the impact, as we're talking about the same amount, 100,000 farmers with five kilowatt pumps is 500 megawatt. The solar plant in Mouazak is 500 megawatt. We managed to have the CTF for the Mouazak project. We didn't manage to have the CTF for farmers, for mm. small projects. How we can look at financing for all those more applications linked to renewables, but small ones. Mm. That's also one of the key questions. Mm. Maybe I allow myself, you didn't say who you wanted to address it, but I allow myself to answer it. I could have also led it to Ahmed, but it may be a more inter-Moroccan kind of um, question and answer. Uh, I'm happy to address this first and have others to, to chip into this. Jeff, the first question on uh, ATI, yeah, what you can do three. about that. I'd like to, well, first of all, the, the, the projects that you described don't fall under the, the description of AGF, so that's not. But secondly, it is absolutely possible if you have uh, an IPP that installs a rooftop solar on top of a, of a shopping mall that is absolutely insurable. Then you look at the credit risk that the shopping mall represents, and then you, uh, if it's a good risk, it, it's absolutely insurable by us or by, by, by other insurers. So there's not a problem. The big problem, and I think it's also the big problem for uh, many renewable IPPs, is the size. Because the transaction cost, the effort to understand the risk, uh, in some cases to assess the the environmental then environmental then uh, impact etc. So all these things, the, the lawyers, uh, all these mm -hmm. things, they, it costs a lot of money, and this, this, the, the cost is not significantly different for small and for for large projects. Mm -hmm. So for me, the only solution is really aggregation. What what you're trying to do is to lump a lot of projects together so that you have a spread of risk, and then ideally for financing, then be able to go to the capital markets and uh, issue bonds so that you can uh, fund it at an acceptable way because otherwise uh, a lender for these small projects they will look for uh, interest rates in Africa easy between uh, 13 and 20 percent and that makes the whole operation extremely inefficient. So uh, I think there and there's probably a need for more creativity on, on aggregation, certification, that the projects are good so that they inspire trust from institutional investors. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. No, thank you very much, Jeff. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think on the, on the question for Morocco, I mean, look, first of all, I must say, um, probably everyone is aware in the room that Morocco has been uh, um, leading really the way on, on uh, large, extremely large-scale solar. So really also, uh, from my side, my compliments to that. Um, but I also fully agree that um, uh, also institutions like my, um, my own, the World Bank, we are still struggling with the small projects. And I think Jeff already alluded to uh, the first item is transaction costs. And not only our own costs as MDBs, but also the whole costs that we need in terms of advisory and, and capacity building. Uh, I think one solution is what uh, Koshik mentioned earlier, is to, to look at programmatic approaches, to try to find many different small projects and bundle them together and have one kind of uh, fit-all approach. And I think the other thing that um, I personally believe is, is, is to take into account more um, going forward. We have to more, more look at what is locally the potential and capacity available. And by that I don't mean the capacity to build PPP units and uh, uh, deal with international laws. I mean the local financial markets. I mean uh, um, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in country that may build certain technical solutions, and no offense to you, Deo, uh, but maybe GE can also play a role there in helping uh, smaller manufacturers to build local solutions. Local solutions that have then several advantages. First, they can be custom-made to what the country really needs, because everywhere in the continent will be different. Secondly, you have a currency issue that is eliminated by that. If you have local manufacturers who are selling local equipment, local currency, a large issue we are facing often by international investors and commercial financiers is that they don't want to take the local currency risks. And here the question is, can local capital markets play more of a role? So I would say I'm probably not answering fully your question and what we shall do. These are more kind of leads of thoughts. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has wants to chip in here, but that's the thing I see. I mean, I think I'd certainly echo the fact that Morocco has been a, a real leader in terms of renewable energy development, and that's really hats off to very, very forward-thinking um, uh, people within, within ministry and within government. The challenge that you raise 
is a very real challenge across the continent. We've done a few three or four transactions in, in Togo, in uh, Rwanda, Burundi, where we've done similar to, to uh, what you described, what I would call either a mini grid or an off grid, or but but really very small scale uh, rural electrification or swapping out diesel for for solar. All of them have been financed in in different ways. All of them have had a DFI element of the financing, some kind of concessional financing. Very very challenging. It's actually I think the responsibility of the multilateral development banks and the uh, agencies who have lots of money and lots of bright minds to come up and knock their heads together and think of some solutions. I agree, local financing is a part of that solution, but whether it's uh, some kind of concessional financing that comes to uh, a renewable energy department that then deploys that locally, there are structures to be, but actually the, your, your question needs to be, you need to be knocking on the doors of your uh, MDBs and Popaco and, and FMO saying, how are, you, how are you planning on helping us here? Because I think it is a, it's a very good and a very key question. Thank you very much, Koshik. I can see that there are some more questions, but I'm also mindful that this panel stands probably between uh, you and your lunch. And uh, we have been ought to uh, um, stick to time. Uh, so we are two minutes past one o'clock now. Um, I would like to really thank uh, all of you here on the panel for a very interesting discussion. Um, I think I didn't come here to say that we're going to resolve all the issues on greening and, and bringing financial solutions today, but I can see a lot of good thoughts and initiatives on all what you're doing. So please join me in uh, giving a great hand of applause to our panelists, and thank you to the audience for the great <laughs> question. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.